welcome to For the Love of Dogs with Janice Wolf. Hey, how is everybody today? Boy, oh boy, 83 degrees here in New Jersey. And that's not even down at the shore, which in, if you live in Jersey, you'd say down the shore. There's apparently no preposition in that sentence. But today is just a gorgeous day, and it reminds us that, you know, we have to take care of our dogs when the weather changes, especially with the crazy weather we've had. You know, I still see people taking their dogs and say, oh, but it's March. Right, but... Remember, and I know I say this all the time, but you got to be careful because inside the uh, the car gets just so brutally hot so quickly, and that dog could still die in a day that's you know sixty degrees. It's potential if it, if it's a you know dark day, it's one thing, but if it's a bright sunny day, you know, yeah, they can uh, they can still have problems. So be smart. Make sure your dogs have enough fresh, clean water. Wash your water bowl, please, people. Wash your food and water bowls out. At least I do it like twice a day. When I have to add more water to the bowl, I don't. I pick up the bowl, I wash it, or I take another clean one out, and I put the new bowl down. So, you know, just think about it. Would you want to, like, share, you know, a disgusting glass of water, and then by the time you get to the very end of it, all of a sudden it's like, ew, that's pretty gross stuff. That's what you're drinking. And your dog is drinking all the bacteria and everything, which brings me to the next situation. Here in Wyatt Manor, we have here in New Jersey, we have a gorgeous facility, uh, about 13,000 square feet. And we have a beautiful, beautiful situation here. We had a dog, really nice little dog, very well behaved, uh, you know, five, six month old doodle thing of some sort, whatever, really cute little guy. And the people were kind of, you know, first-time dog owners, and they said, oh, yeah, the dog had Giardia, but it's all gone now. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) I need a negative fecal exam before you come in. She said, why? It's He's done with the medication. I said, that doesn't mean it's gone. I had a wonderful patient, very, very nice dog, had started out aggressive, but ended out real nice dog, mixed breed dog, who had, I believe it was either four or five rounds of medication, um, you know, metronidazole and, you know, either parental strongit or, you know, the one we usually use, Tanacare, and it just wouldn't go away. And you have to make sure that if you're going somewhere, uh, if you're sending your dog off somewhere, get him a negative fecal, you know, get, get it checked out. And this way you know if he's got something because a lot of places would have taken this dog. I just told them, unfortunately, I couldn't take the dog because it would have had to have a negative fecal. And then coincidentally, the dog got sick uh, the morning it was supposed to come. Uh, so, you know, I was smart not to take it. And, and I ask you all to just be a little bit more aware, be a little more careful um, you know, one of my dogs, uh, Brandy, is not doing um, great today. She, we just found out she's got cancer. She's old. I mean, she's old. She's up there into her mid-teens already, which for a Ridgeback is great. Um, but the the nurse, or you know, it's like a physician's assistant. These people, I hate to say, like a vet tech, because she's you know almost a vet herself. She said, you know, I've never seen, and, and remember how this is a specialty hospital with you know probably ten thousand clients eas- easily. She said, I've never seen anybody do so much for their dogs as you do. She said, I hope I come back someday as one of your dogs. Um, And I said, well, I'm a lot older than you are, so chances are that won't happen. But if it does, I promise I'll take good care of you. So, you know, that brings me to a lot of times people just don't know. I think ignorance is bliss, but ignorance is also very dangerous. You have people, especially on social media, who are hiding behind a profile. There's this new thing called Facebook jail. Heck, I didn't know there was another. I know a few people, um, not nice people, a few people who've spent a lot of time in jail or in prison. But what the heck is Facebook jail? My little nephew, uh, who, well, he's not little anymore. He's in his 20s, now mid-20s. But my nephew Josh, when he was a little boy, um, when we would play with his little toy cars, he He'd say, they need to go to driver jail. They're not being nice. And, you know, I I think sometimes their Facebook jail um, really needs to be for a lot of different things. It seems that 
you know, when you get your uh, your news through like AOL or any of these places, you get very skewed news. And, you know, regardless of who you like, who you don't like, just tell me the news. Please don't go into your opinion. I don't care who you are. I really don't care what your opinion is. Just give me the news. That's how I am, right? I'm very blunt. I wasn't like that as a kid. I wasn't like that into my young adulthood. But I've gotten that way, and that's something that age and time is very kind at doing, changing you so you stop wanting all the fluff. You don't want, like, oh, don't tell me, you know, that, that, oh, it's all okay, and then it's not, and don't make me feel better about Just tell me so then I can process. I'm telling you guys right now, when I see dogs, and especially first-time dog owners who don't know, Please get off the Internet. Please stop Googling a million times, you know, what's the best way to fix my aggressive puppy? Because it depends on the individual dog and the individual owners, the individual situation. So there is no answer. And if somebody answers you on the Internet for free, you want to tell me how good that advice is? What's it worth? Probably free. So... Get, I mean, if you like what I do and you like the way I talk and that I'm blunt and I'm super knowledgeable and I've been doing this for, I don't even want to say how many years, but it's, you know, two scores, you know, and, and, and not four scores in seven years, but like two scores and a couple of others, um, just of what I've been doing in my education. So if you believe me and you're listening right now, then get a copy of my book. It's literally less than $10. It's called Shh Happens, S-H-H-H, Happens, Dog Behavior 101. If I could get you a, a free code, although Amazon doesn't do that, if I could do that, I would give it away for free because I just want people to know what to do, and I want them to understand how important it is that they get good, viable information not from some 15-year-old, you know, in Kentucky or not some 60-year-old, you know, who worked in a bakery or owned his own, you know, laundry business or something. And then tomorrow, you know, I is a dog trainer. And people calling themselves things, ask the people, forget about these certifications because you can take those tests. If you studied, I literally anybody listening right now could study a, probably for about an hour and you could pass these tests. So it, it doesn't mean anything. What means something is word of mouth. And speak with people and say, what kind of method do you use, all right? Because what happens, and I'm getting back to the Giardia and Parvo and all that cleanliness situation is, this is the time of year. So if somebody says, oh, my dog threw up, and somebody or, or, you know, or had uh, diarrhea, somebody's going to say, Give them chicken and rice, which is fine. But if the dog is throwing up and has diarrhea and you try chicken and rice for three days, you might have a dead dog because Parvo killed him, or he might have Giardia, or he could have cancer. So if anything persists, if you have, let's say, a dog who's, who's vomiting and it's every morning and he's vomiting bile and it's been for the last year, maybe your dog is stressed you can call us. We will be happy to help you, but at least you know that you're going to get good information because Giardia is out there. Parvo's already starting this year. Uh, of course, we have Lyme disease. We have all these things, but, you know, your local yokel dog trainer is not going to know, and your local yokel person who's a dog trainer who's calling themselves a behaviorist who you know, is, is taking a dog on a choker chain, literally a metal chain around his neck and literally lifting an, an 80 pound dog off the ground and hanging on to him. So he's choking and you're ruining his trachea forever. That is not okay. I don't care how aggressive the dog is. And I deal, listen, nobody comes to me and says, hey, Janice, can you, can you come see my perfectly well-behaved 10 week golden retriever puppy? Because I just want you to come over and visit and see how good he is. No. People call, the dog bit my kid, the dog bit my sister, the dog attacked another dog, my dog got attacked by another dog. You know, my dog is a feral, my dog is a reformed pit bull, my dog is a German shepherd with weak nerve syndrome. What the heck do I do? Those are the dogs I help. 
So when you get a puppy, because everybody thinks, I'll just get a puppy. Because if I get a puppy, it won't have issues from somebody else ruining it. But you're not a canine behaviorist, and you're not even a bad dog trainer. You're a regular person. You might have had one well-behaved dog. You might have had two well-behaved dogs. But if you have a lot of dogs, at some point in your life, you're going to have dogs that you don't know what to do. And that's when you call me. And I'm happy to help. But you have to also remember that physical things can be very responsible for the way a dog behaves. So for a second, let's just step back. Okay. You have a dog and the dog randomly gets aggressive. You have no idea why. This has been the best dog in the world. He's six years old, seven years old, greatest dog in the world. And he just bit your your six-year-old who he grew up with. He bit your six-year-old kid. Well, why did he suddenly bite your six-year-old kid? If he were going to bite, he would have bitten when your kid was a toddler and your kid fell on or near him. But now he's six years old. So what do we do? Oh, my God, the dog's something wrong with him. Let's put him to sleep because it's inconvenient. Now, not everybody and probably very few of my uh, wonderful listeners and followers, very few of you guys are going to do that. But it happens. It happens all the time. Okay. So first thing you do is look at a physical issue. All right, a dog randomly having aggression. All right, is the dog getting a little heavy? Have you noticed them packing on some COVID-20 over here? If you notice that the dog is kind of getting paunchy, like you may be, it could be a thyroid issue. Guess what? Thyroid issues, hypo, low thyroid, hypothyroid, can actually cause aggression. Did you know that? Guess what else can cause aggression? Tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease. Lyme disease, not every dog, you know, limps around and says, oh, I've got Lyme disease. They can get protozoal, bacterial things that can get into their spinal cord or up into their sinus cavity and can create issues going up into the brain. The dog could have had a seizure that you didn't see when you were at work. He could have, he could have a brain tumor. And it can even be sometimes in rare cases, but if it's yours, you're going to want to know. The vaccine for Lyme disease and certain other vaccines are very difficult for some dogs. Not all, not many, not most, but they can be a problem. So you want to go to your vet, your vet, and if you don't like your vet, find a better vet. But most veterinarians are going to be good enough to catch any of these, and they can do what's called a four-way snap test or 4DX. Or D like a dog, X like an X-ray. They do a 4DX. They can tell if your dog has any tick-borne diseases. The other thing, things like Addison's disease can cause problems. Cushing's, things that are, that are endocrine, things that are your thyroid issues. And, they, and again, obviously brain tumors. And even heart murmurs, which is why when your dog has a heart murmur, if it's a, a, a one or a probably into a two, out of six, you're probably okay. But once you hit about a three and some, I've seen it in like Cocker Spaniels and those type of dogs that break in some phallic Spaniel dogs and some others. Um, I've seen dogs with a, you know, like a a two heart murmur who got aggressive because of it. I had worked with a beautiful Rottweiler, gorgeous, not well-bred. They rescued him. And I have a feeling he probably got into something when he was a puppy because he had a lot of really odd things just that when you put them together, I'm not going to discuss it because I'm not a veterinarian, although my daughter is, but I'm not going to discuss that. But I was the one who I told them, I said, your dog has a really serious heart murmur. She said, how do you know? I said, because I'm looking at everything else. I'm watching the dog pant when there's no, you know, no stresses and it's a cool day. Um, And I'm also watching the fact that your dog, has become aggressive and started a little bit and has gotten worse. Now, what would you have thought? You would have thought, oh, something happened and it's behavioral. It wasn't. Unfortunately, it was, I think he had a five, five out of six. I mean, six are pretty much, you know, you you don't hear sixes because they're not alive. But that really is like congestive heart failure. There are a lot of different things. And crazy enough, if you anybody volunteers at a nursing home or, or a place where there are a lot of elderly people, you 
can tell when one of them has a urinary tract infection because, my God, it makes them nasty. Well, same thing can happen with you guys. If you have a dog, that the dog has behavioral issues, sometimes it can be that, and sometimes it can be allergens. It can be wheat, not weed, as my client a few days ago. I've been just slammed with with so many uh, customers and so many patients, new patients. Um, But, yeah, you know, you have to look at it and think to yourself, you know, what exactly is it that is going on in this world, you know? It really is just, uh, you know, kind of a crazy thing. So if we're able to um, look at, you know, the way things are and say, you know, okay, I'm, uh, you know, hopefully going to be... um, you know, figuring this all out, um, you know, you may be able to actually um, make something, uh, you know, make a very, very smart decision. And you may be able to actually be one of the people who can figure out why something's happening. I mean, that's what I love to do. Um, We all know that, you know, obviously if a dog is getting uh, aggressive with, um, you know, something that's going on, or someone who's doing something, or another dog, or whatever. We we know if it's kind of a random thing, but or if it's something where it's certain dogs and not certain dogs. So you know, look at the physical part first. Um, if it's something that has been there for a very long time, yes, of course it can be behavioral. Most of that is behavioral, but maybe ten percent of the time it is physical. And I just had that with somebody who called me. I wouldn't even take her as a as a patient yet, because she told me about the dog, and I said, oh, really, wow, um, did your dog gain weight since you got him? She's like, yeah, I can't believe how much weight he gained. Okay, does your dog's nose, is it kind of, you know, is the hair kind of uh, around the nose kind of kind of falling off a little bit, and is it getting kind of like pinkish, but he's losing like the hair above his nose going up toward his eyes on the top of the muzzle? And she's like, yeah, it kind of is, yeah. So it has the hair gotten kind of coarse. It's not like soft like it used to be. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. I said, I think your dog has a thyroid issue. Would you please go to your doctor and get a full thyroid panel like they have for OFFA, uh, Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, OFA? Um, it's, I think it's OFFA.org. But anyway, if you have a purebred dog, and I believe they'll even do it for a mixed breed dog because, you know, obviously mixed breeds tend to, they say, oh, they're healthier, but not these mixed breeds that they're inbreeding. Um, it's more the dogs that, like, your neighbor's German Shepherd breeds to the other neighbor, neighbor's Chihuahua. And, yes, I've actually seen weird things like that. Um, but, yes, there there are things that will happen that you can actually figure out. So on the off chance that it is something, guess what? The dog uh, had the full panel, full thyroid panel with the free T3 and T4, and the dog was hypothyroid. And I said to her, I said, get him on the thyroid medication. I mean, this was just like within the last week or so. I said, get him on the thyroid, the thyrol, L, thyroxin, or synthroid, whatever your vet puts him on. And then in a few weeks or a month, if your dog still has the same behavioral issues, then call me and we'll work together. So I'll let you guys know if I remember how the dog is going to do. But we have to be able to look at specifically the way we are um, kind of diagnosing. Everybody goes on the Internet and they're like asking questions, which is great. But don't ask questions of somebody in a group on medical issues. I mean, listen, I know more than... (laughs) A lot of people, a lot of people. Um, I, I know more about certain things than a lot of veterinarians because it's a specialty I do, right? So I have veterinarians who will ask me behavioral questions. Uh, Ken Fisher, I love Kenny. He's great. Um, some of my other vets through the years have uh, have asked me about behavior because they don't do behavior. Same way as if I'm not sure of something medical, I bring my dog to the vet. Of course I'm going to bring my dog to the vet. I'm not going to ask somebody in a Facebook group or in a social media post, ooh, my dog's peeing blood. What should I do? Get your dog to the vet. And there's going to be some idiot or a well-meaning schmuck, and I'm sorry if you are the idiot or well-meaning schmuck, 
don't give out medical advice. My goodness. And preface your comment with, I am not a veterinarian, and you should probably go to the veterinarian. However, I had a dog with a similar issue, and this is what my dog had. So it's fine to share your experiences, but don't say, oh, don't you don't have to go to the veterinarian. You don't have to do that. Just you know, do what I did. It works because you don't know because you're not a vet. Even any veterinarian, and I still have yet to find one single veterinarian who will, even with me, with all the dogs I have and all the knowledge I have and, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably a million dollars in vet bills, I just had 300000 just the last, like, two and a half years, or not even, two years, um, with all my dogs. So if somebody tells you not to go to the vet, they're, they're stupid. They don't know. Even if they have, it sounds like they have the exact same thing as your dog had, their dog could have had parvo and your dog has giardia. And now you, you try to get medication online to fix it, but you don't know what it is. Please, please, please fight the urge to become the expert. I fought the urge for my first, you don't want to know how many years to be the expert until I realized, hey, I know my stuff. And about 30 years ago, I started realizing, wow, I'm, you know, I really, I'm good at this, right? So you start saying, okay, let me learn. So I shadowed several of the vets that I thought were wonderful, wonderful vets. And I learned from those veterinarians. That's why I know so much. You don't learn from talking, you learn from listening. So I spent a lot of time listening and studying. I mean, I was in 4-H when I was like nine years old. I remember the whole science, veterinary science program we had. I learned all about this stuff before, you know, before I was probably out of elementary school. Um, so, you know, learning about the systems, learning about conformation, the different body parts, anatomy and physiology. So I have this since I was a kid. And I will go now on soundness, lameness, things like that. Um, or good movement, quality movement, I'm an expert on that, okay? So I can look at a horse or look at a dog or look at pretty much any animal other than like a bearded dragon or a frog, and I can tell you where that injury is based on how the animal moves and where the animal puts or doesn't put its foot down or back or side or, or unloading it a bit. So that's where, you know, yes, I have expertise, but if you ask me, hey, my dog started acting a little listless and, you know, he's peeing a little bit of blood, you know, and he vomits, but there's nothing in it. And then it goes away and he's fine for a month and then it comes back. I know probably what it is, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to say, well, you know, I think it's time for you to go to your veterinarian. Well, Janice, what do you think it is? It doesn't matter what I think it is because if it were my dog, then I can give myself advice and I can take my advice. But if you have a dog with an issue, let's just say, and this is where people practice what they shouldn't because they think they're some kind of expert that they're not. If you could actually, let's say you, you go on one of these chat groups and somebody gives you medical advice who's not a veterinarian. And if they are, then they're really in trouble because they don't, and typically vets will not do that. But let's just say there's a veterinarian on there, or there's somebody who's a vet tech, because that's my favorite. I'm a vet tech. Well, you can be a vet tech because you work at a vet's office, or you can be a licensed vet tech who is, you know, has gone through two or three years um, of, of school that's not much different from, you know, a veterinary medicine degree, like a DMV, <laughs> sorry, DVM, we call them DMVs, that's a joke, or a VMD if you came from UPenn. And we can just do that, right? Because if somebody says, hey, this is what I think is wrong with your dog, that's fine. But let's say you'd say, oh, you don't have to go to the vet. Don't waste your money. Just go and get coconut oil like some idiot did to one of my dogs and, and gave my dog a tumor because she wouldn't take the dog to the vet, even though I was paying for everything. And she, oh, coconut oil, fix coconut oil. It's, it's great to suffocate you know, parasites and things like that. And it's great on your skin. Coconut oil is not going to be like chemotherapy. Coconut oil is not going to be as good as, let's say, things like amusoprosin 
or uh, mupirocin or, uh, you know, erythromycin or any of those, uh, you know, or topical. So if your dog has a problem and you're, in, you're asking somebody you don't know from a group you don't know and they're giving you veterinary advice, I think really, honestly, I'm beating this to death because I don't want you to have a dog who dies. What would you do if all of a sudden the dog... Uh, your dog dies because of the advice they gave you. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to sue them? You don't even know who they are. You don't even know are they real or not, right? Because you know it's pretty easy to just get a fake um, ID or fake uh, you know Facebook profile. So you know you want to put your animal or your child's life. That's what I say. Imagine it's your kid instead of your dog. Oh, gee, my kid's got. Like, my kid's kind of, you know, my kid fell, and, you know, he's kind of, like, walking in circles, and, you know, he was on the floor for a while, and he's got a big lump on his head, but I put ice on it and, you know, told him to go to bed, and, you know, about three days ago, I told him to go to bed, and he's still sleeping, you know. Meanwhile, the kid had a stroke or a seizure or, you know, or something, and here you are with a dead child. Well, don't do it with your dog. And definitely don't do it with your child. Just go to your vet. And if you have questions, there's even like poison control, which, yes, I granted um, poison control does tend to charge a lot of money uh, for, for that. But you know what? If I'd rather just go to an emergency vet than spend 60 or 70 bucks on poison control. But there are things you can do, like talk to your veterinarian and always, always, always have a syringe that you can fill with peroxide and water, which if your dog does ingest something, and even then, you have to be able to know what did the dog ingest, right? You can't just, you know, say, oh, yeah, you should, uh, you should make the dog throw it up because certain things that are corrosive or if the dog, you know, actually ingested something that could cut or hurt it on the way, um, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, the dog is, you know, not going to re-injure itself, right? So, um, you know, just you go to the vet, go to the vet, go to the vet, okay? So we're going to also talk um, in a little bit when we get to shelter dog to service dog, we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can start to train your dog to be a service dog. And we're also going to talk a little bit about therapy dogs not just service dogs. I want to do a little bit of that because we've had quite a few emails about people saying, hey, now that COVID's over, I have this really cute puppy and the puppy is actually really, really good and I'd like to, you know, visit hospitals and all when we get done with this. So I will do that. Um, I'm sorry to beat you guys up, to, you know, today, but, you know, go to the vet if you have to and, and get a good relationship with a veterinarian and ask local people, Ask your friends, ask your neighbors to whom they go and get the name of a good emergency hospital because it's just not always that it's the best because, you know, they've got a five-star rating. I mean, you know, it's pretty easy to just put whatever you want so you really don't know what everything is. But just try to do that. Try to start preparing ahead of time. Get yourself a little, almost like a little first aid kit. We're going to be uh, putting something like that together soon. So, um, we're going to be back in a moment. So, more spirited discussion, but this time about service dogs and training therapy dogs. We'll be right back. We'll be back with the second segment, which is for From Shelter Dog to Service Dog, which we've been doing since, what, 2012? We've been around doing this show, and uh, oh my gosh, it's been really a long time. Well, let me start by saying thank you to all of you who have little puppies, what, whether they're doodles or they're some kind of mix of something else or they're grand champion show puppies. What's really interesting is, you know, just thinking about what are we going to have after COVID, right? So... If we have, you know, something like, let's say, you know, let's say we have um, a poodle mixed with, I don't know, a, let's say a Labrador or a 
sheepdog or something. So now once we we get that and we have this, this little puppy and the puppy isn't, you know, that isn't stuck with behavioral issues because it's inbred or maybe you got lucky and you have this great little dog. If you want to start treating this dog as, as if it were in training, you know, yes, it's possible. It's absolutely possible and very uh, likely that if you start right and it's got a sweet temperament that the dog could become a therapy dog. Now, I've explained in years, in years past, in months past, in weeks past, about the difference between the temperament for a therapy dog versus the temperament for a service dog. A service dog, you want to focus on one person. Now, we do train wonderful, wonderful dogs. We have them all over the country. And that these dogs are actually trained therapy to do therapy but they're trained as service dogs, so they aren't focused on everybody. So think about for a minute that you have uh, a little puppy, and the puppy is just so happy. He's just a knucklehead. There's a little puppy named Keshet. I call her Keshi. She's an old English sheep dog mixed with, a, I think, a mini poodle or maybe a regular poodle. I don't know, but she's adorable, and she's very sweet. So, But when she focuses on you, uh, and this is different from when she was little, little. She was about almost six months now. She starts to focus, and she looks at you. And if you don't look back at her, she kind of tries to get your attention. So that kind of a temperament where a dog specifically wants to kind of hang out with one particular person, that is definitely much more conducive to a therapy dog than it is to a service. I'm sorry, service dog. I got, I'm so tired. I'll tell you something. I'm wiped today. So if, if a dog is, is super friendly with everybody and doesn't care who it's being petted by, then that dog is good therapy dog. Keshi would be a good little service dog because even though she's friendly with everyone, when she bonds, she's really bonded. And Rhodesian Ridgebacks, who I've been breeding for 30, uh, close to 40 years, can't even believe it. But Rhodesian Ridgebacks are great service dogs, phenomenal. They're phenomenal with children. They have a great sense of smell. They're super smart, usually smarter than the people who own them. And I don't mean that with my people, but if you ever heard, if you've ever seen a, a, a bad Ridgeback, it's because either it was a really backyard breeder, which there are a few, but not many in the country. Um, but it could also be that the dog is too dominant and the breeder didn't, uh, you know, let the person understand that it's a, you know, it's a smart breed and they can be very overconfident. Um, but Ridgebacks, when you train them, I mean, you train them even poorly, they're great dogs, but they're phenomenal family dogs, but they will bond strong and super hard just to one person more than anybody. So that makes them a great service dog. It doesn't make them a great therapy dog, although some of them are super friendly with everybody. A lot of mine are very friendly, but I put their vest on and bang, they are there for me and they'll ignore everybody and everything else. So remember, for a therapy dog, which is what we're going to actually talk about a little bit today, you want to have a, a dog or a puppy who isn't a big jumper, isn't overly excited. So if you say, oh, I've got a, you know, a two-year-old, you know, some sort of doodle that, you know, it, it's a great dog, but, you know, he jumps up and he's so cute. Well, jumping up is not good. Even a therapy dog, which doesn't need a lot of training typically, even a therapy dog needs to have a certain level of training because you don't want them jumping up on people. You don't want them randomly scratching somebody. You don't want them to be stealing food out of the patient's mouth or licking the kid's face uh, and pulling his feeding tube out because, you know, here you are, uh, you know, you've got this dog and the dog is trying to get the food that's inside the feeding tube. Yes, there was actually somebody who got a service dog from another organization and the dog actually pulled the feeding tube out and scratched and nipped at the kid the first 45 minutes it was there. Um, that is not, and that was supposed to be a service dog. What a joke. So a therapy dog, we cut them a little bit of a break. Think about, Evan, the average 100 dogs. So let's put, you know, 
let's put 25% really well-bred AKC Grand Champion show dog lines. So they should be the best, right? And then let's say, you know, a, a breeder or a person who breeds these mixed breed dogs, but who really actually cares, which there are not many, but there are a couple I've seen who they really, really seem to care about the dogs. They're just breeding mutts, but they are doing the best they can to make these dogs the best they can be. Let's put that at 25%. Let's put pet store dogs as a 25%. And let's put um, the last one, 25% for rescue dogs. Yay, rescue dogs. We love rescue dogs. So if we have 100% of dogs, so let's say there are 100 dogs, we have 25 of each of those categories. And now we're looking for a therapy dog. There will be from among those, that group, there will be roughly 10 dogs out of that 100, very diverse dogs, that could be, not will be, but could potentially have the potential, the talent, the, the ability to become a therapy dog. Now, there are places that will tell you, oh, you can just do eight hours of training and we'll give you a therapy dog license or certification. You can do eight hours and you're going to bring a dog in to see special needs children or people who may be flailing their arms. You better get a good insurance policy because you're going to wind up with a lawsuit and no house. So you want to look for those out of those 10 dogs who could be and you want the ones or one who come to you, who seem to understand, who look into your eyes, who, you know, want to be petted. They sit next to you. They're silly and funny, but they're not jumping. They're not out of control. They're not running all over. They're not racing around a room. That's what you need if you're going to look to have a therapy dog. Now, of that 100 dogs, how many can become service dogs? If you're lucky, I'll say one in a 100. One in a hundred dogs, not one in a litter, one in a hundred dogs. So for instance, with my Ridgebacks, we'll have a litter that's 10 or 12. I mean, they're, they have big litters and all 10 or all 12 will be all champion show dogs or could be champion show dogs. They just don't, you know, the owners don't want to uh, take them that route. They could be service dogs. They could potentially be therapy dogs, but it's all in the way. Once you get a dog from a really top-notch breeder who stands behind his or her litters and, and dogs, then you can change things around a little bit, but you can't take a dog who's super happy and jumping all over everybody and turn them into, you know, like the, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. You can't do that with every dog. About one in a hundred dogs has the potential to be a service dog. So if you have a dog that you rescued or bought or whatever, and you didn't really know what you were doing and you get this dog and you're like, oh, he's great. He just doesn't like little children, but it's okay. Cause I'm not going to have little children. Oh, but if he's going to be a service dog, he's going to be in airports, potentially. He's going to be a supermarket, potentially. He's going to be in, you know, a park, potentially. Costco or BJ's, potentially. Um, are there children in those places? Of course there are children in those places. So why do people continue to do this? I had somebody when I was in Indianapolis with my friend Cindy doing uh, cancer detection. I was doing the cancer detection with my dogs. I was with Savannah um, doing the FDIC convention as I did, I think, four years running. And we did, you know, over 10,000 um, people just in, in the FDIC over those years, probably even more. And there was a woman, young woman, maybe late 20s, maybe, um, might have been mentally disturbed. And she had this looked like a just a poorly bred golden retriever or half Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever and half golden. But it was a cute dog. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't as big as a golden, but it, it was definitely fear aggressive. And I walked by with Savannah in vest. Savannah didn't even look, of course. And this dog was trying to kill her. And then the woman like yanked on it and the dog cowered. And I mean, I remember because I have an eidetic memory, I remember I could draw every hair on this dog's body of how terrified it was. And then the dog, you know, the woman petted it, then the dog lunged at us again. And I finally said, 
you know, you know, because she had a service dog vest on. I said, ma'am, I said, is that a service dog? She goes, she goes, it's my service dog. And I said, okay, well, can you just control your dog? Because I, I'm just concerned, you know, I'm trying to get away. Uh, but, you know, we were waiting online for, um, for something, so we couldn't get too far away. And I, all I could think of is, okay, we know your dog isn't a service dog, but why are you hitting your dog? Why are you scaring your dog? Maybe that's why the dog is like that. So, you know, you never know when somebody has a dog and it has a vest or they say it's a service dog. And, you know, we don't want to offend people, certainly. And, I mean, I use a service dog. I use multiple service dogs sometimes. So we don't want to do that. But yet we need to have some kind of legitimate certifying body, not AKC for the CGC or the therapy dog um, program for that. You need to have some independent group of people who are behaviorists, who know what they're looking at, and who actually will be able to evaluate that dog and give it the yay or nay. Now, sometimes, and this happens a lot because people, you know, always come to me and they're like, hey, Janice, you know, can you guys, you and Merlin's kids, you know, would you be able to, you know, check my personal dog or somebody wants to donate a dog? So, yeah, I can do that. But if your dog isn't going to be good or if you know your dog is fearful or fear aggressive, why do we want to give that dog more responsibility? We don't want to give it more responsibility. We want to let that dog be like like a four-year-old, five-year-old kid who their biggest worry is that there weren't any Oreos left for, you know, for dessert. Not having a dog who's fearful or dominant or who is just obviously not cut out for this business, so to speak, as, you know, being a candidate to be a service dog. Why would you want that dog to be that? That's like, you know, setting your dog up for failure. Why do you want to set up your dog for failure? Why do you, don't you set your dog up for success? So when you're working with the dog and you want to do something in the therapy dog realm, I think a good thing for that would be for you guys to try to understand what you're going to need to do. So think of somebody who's sitting in a nursing home. Why are they in a nursing home or why are they in a hospital? But let's say nursing home first. So pre-COVID, and now that so many, unfortunately, so many elderly people have passed with the, the pandemic and all, if, if you say like, okay, why is that, like that nice 85-year-old woman, why is she in a nursing home? Because nobody could take care of her home. Does she have a feeding tube or does she have, you know, issues? Was she injured? Did she have a stroke? You know, it's we shouldn't be warehousing old people. Uh, I think that's horrible. I think we should try to have them have, you know, a good life at the end of their lives. It's very important because we're all hopefully, God willing, going to get to that point at some point. So what might that individual do? What might that 85-year-old woman do? She might want to give that dog a big hug and a squeeze. Well, if your dog doesn't like being hugged by strangers, it's not going to be a good therapy dog. The woman might cough unexpectedly or, you know, might flail her arm because she's got some kind of an issue. Um, And the dog might get scared. She might accidentally hit the dog or drop something on the dog or, you know, whatever could happen. So if your dog is that kind of dog who, oh, he's so cute, but he really doesn't have the best temperament like a lot of the, the poodle mixes that I deal with. Remember, nobody calls me with the best whatever mix there is. They call me with the ones that have aggression issues, and I see a ton of them. So even though you think your dog is great with your family, if you say, well, my dog gets kind of nervous when he's around people or he doesn't like beeping noises and loud noises and shopping carts. Well, guess what? What's in a hospital? IV poles, you know, different medic- medication cards, um, people who smell like cancer, people who smell like old things, people who, you know, do weird things. Um, something falls, something drops, something beeps, monitor goes off. So think about it. Does your dog have what it takes? And that's 10 out of 100 could make it. The service dog is a whole different thing. But therapy dog, if your dog has that kind of temperament where he, you know, likes to be around people and he's not a jumpy dog, 
you can actually reach out to us for that too. We, we can help you with that through Merlin's Kids. Merlin's Kids trains people to, uh, you know, to do this kind of stuff. We have certification programs actually, and it's very cool. Um, so, you know, this is, this is what Merlin's Kids has been doing for many years, long before we even were Merlin's Kids. We've been training people to become service dog trainers. We've been training people also to train their own dogs to become therapy dogs. And we've also been training people and dogs, service dogs, for uh, umpteen years. Um, and it's a great thing to be able to help others. But start out with your dog. And if you are going to try, if let's say you have some experience, if you're going to try to train somebody's dog to be a service dog or you're going to try to train it to be a therapy dog, your first at least 10 service dogs you should not even charge somebody because they're not going to be the level of what you'll need. And probably your first 30, 20 to 30 therapy dogs, same thing. So give people the services for what it's worth, free. If you don't have a track record, please don't charge people. Or better yet, learn how to do it. You know, to be certified for us, for Merlin's kids, in order to be what we call level one trainer, you need like 250 hours of hands-on plus a very detailed, almost a year-long course, okay? Level twos have to do the one-year course, and I think it's 400 hours hands-on, um, and you have to be able to train, I think it's three service dogs, and they have to all be in the same background so they have to like all be mobility or all be autism or all be hearing or all be whichever one you want to do all be ptsd and then if you want to go to our level three you've got to do 10 dogs 10 before we will certify that you know what you're doing because guess what even if you are using the same commands it's like people we have kinesthetic learners we have visual we have audio we have multiple mixed learning we have all kinds of stuff well dogs are like that too and everything in dog behavior and everything in dog training is really about timing. You know how there's a cute TV commercial about some guy and he he wants to go out with this girl and uh, he says something and then she sends it and he realizes she didn't get it. So he answers a previous question when she said, you know, something like, if we go, do you want to go back to my house and you know, blah, 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 and he, he said the opposite of what he wanted because he's answering a prior question. And it was the cutest little commercial, but timing is everything because if you're answering a previous text when he said, what, what's wrong, you don't love me anymore, and you're saying, no, I don't, but you were answering the one that says, do you want to go out with your friends tonight, and you said, no, I don't, put that toothpaste back in the tube. So that's what I'm saying you have to get re very good at this, and you have to be able to know not just with one dog, not just with two dogs, not with five, but at least 10 dogs. And I mean at least. And I'm not talking about working with 10 dogs once. You've got to work with them and see it through. It's not as easy as it looks, and this is why so many of these places, there are two of them out in Colorado, that one went bust, one's on the way to being bust. They rip people off, and... You know, they didn't give people dogs or they gave somebody, you know, this one lady, two different dogs that were both horrible. The first one was aggressive and the sec and, and completely untrained and like seven or eight months old, which service dogs are not seven or eight months old. Sorry about that. They have to be at least bare minimum 15 months old through all their fear phases. So you've got to make sure that if you're going to do that, that you're doing it right. You can always learn from us. You can reach out to us at 855-449-9288. Um, and you can always check it out and make sure that you have a good, happy, healthy holiday for those of us who are Jewish, um, happy Passover. And for those of us next week who are going to celebrate Easter, enjoy your, your Easter uh, period of time. Enjoy your family, your friends. Much love. God bless. And we'll talk to you next week. 